Hi everybody watching at home, I'm Phoenix and today I'm going to be talking about the yin and the yang. So life, if you divide it up, is made up of opposites, or at least it can be seen in terms of opposites. I mean, how can something exist, like an image let's say, in one's mind without there first being two neurons for it to bounce between? You know what I mean? How can an equation exist without two variables synthesizing and working together to produce some kind of outcome, some kind of reality, all right? Now, when I say that you can divide the world up into two parts, I don't mean to say that there is a division in the world, but more like there is a polarization, all right? So a lot of the time when people see the yin and the yang, as one symbol, I mean, they tend to think that it does represent division, that it does represent opposites. You know, the yin is opposite to yang and vice versa. And loosely speaking, this is true. Strictly speaking, though, it, it's tripe. And they're not actually opposite. They're not opposing each other and separate from each other. But they're mutually definitive. And they mutually necessitate each other's existence. Just like the feminine and masculine with yin and yang. You're kind of masculine without feminine. You're kind of feminine without masculine. You know, you're kind of water without fire and a kind of air without earth and all of that jazz you know so the idea is that really instead of seeing the yin and the yang as being uh, two separate entities or two separate concepts or ideas or principles it's, the idea is to recognize that it's really one singular entity and there is only one principle one process that is polarized. So imagine if you had a balloon, right? And this balloon was full of nothing, just pure potential, right? If you then twisted the balloon, so you've got like two bulbs and you've got like an eight figure, all of a sudden one half, you can say, negates and becomes pure light, pure manifestation, pure consciousness and movement, pure yang, while the other one remains as nothingness, as pure potential, as yin which is pretty much what they represent. Yin represents the wave to the particle of the yang. Like I said, it's the fire to the water. Uh, sorry, fire is yang, water is yin, because yin is very fluid, whereas yang is very rigid, all right? And yang is all about movement, whereas yin is about stillness, nothingness, and everythingness, darkness, light, all right? Heart head or mind and thoughts whereas this is all about feeling the feminine mother nature all right so when you look throughout life you can see yin and yang and its principles and the concept applied in many ways or at least you can apply the concept to everything all right so take uh relationships well let's let's not go into relationships because that's that's going to open up a whole field and i'm just not going to be able to stop all right, let's just take basic emotions, all right? So pleasure and pain, for example. You know, I wouldn't say that one represents the other with yin or yang. You know, yang can be both pleasurable and painful, so it can yin. But you need the two, not opposites, but polarities. Because happiness and sadness, they're not separate emotions. It all comes from the same source. It's all the same energy. If you look at is if you look at emotion as being energy in motion, it's all the same energy, but it changes its motion. All right? There's no division. It, it doesn't stop being one kind of energy and then become some other foreign kind of energy. There's never separation. All of your feelings define each other and lead into each other and flow. And just like water turning to ice and back they change state. And that's all yin and yang is, it's two different states. You've got the inert state and then you've got inertia or movement, momentum of yang. So, yeah, the idea is, you know, you can, you can apply it to, like, yeah, that's where I was, emotions. So happiness, sadness, pleasure, pain, they define each other. If you don't have pain in life, then you don't know what relief is, you know, or pleasure. You know, if you don't have happiness in life, then what is it to be sad, if that's all you know? Without sadness, what is it to be happy? You know what I mean? So, even though 
because I've talked about how you can apply it to everything in life. You can, so to speak, divide up everything or dichotomize, you know, polarize everything into two extremes on the end of the spectrum. But at the end of the day, reality does not exist in extremes. All right, it doesn't exist in black or white or yin or yang, but it exists within the middle, within the gray area of the two working in unison and synthesizing. For reality, the way I see it is nothing but the synthesis of absolute potential and relative manifestation or relative consciousness. Consciousness relating to itself through all its different forms and variables from the field of potential. All the particles doing their thing from, from the, the, the wave field. And even in quantum physics, you can split an atom, shoot it in two different directions, manipulate this atom on this side, and while you do it, exactly with the same time, simultaneously, the other half of that atom will react in the same way as if you are two manipulating that atom, even though you're not touching it. So it shows that everything is linked, all right? Because it comes from the same space. We all share the same mind, so to speak, essentially, but we individualize it differently. And if you look at the word individual, this is going to blow your mind a bit. If you look at the word individual a bit differently and break it up a bit, you actually see that it is in divide dual, meaning to exist in the divide of duality. And that is what it means to be an individual, is to exist in the divide of duality. So you're not in either extreme. You're not in black, white, yin, yang, feminine, masculine, but we are both combined. And you can look at reality as being a shadow realm all right a shadow realm because let's say that yin represents god's ineffable face meaning it's undescribable it doesn't have any features or aspects attributes any no quantities whatsoever it's pure quality and it's pure potential pure color but without form all right is god and when i say color i mean it's still darkness but in principally speaking it is what is essential. So it's the face of God, the faceless face of God, right? And then you've got Yang, which is like the mirror for God to look into, the particulate mirror and the mirror of manifestation so that he or she or it can see its own face, can recognize itself. You know what I'm saying? First, it's got to cognize itself, and that's what we're doing. We're cognizing reality but really it's so that God can recognize him, her, itself through our cognition across the board or from the same wave of consciousness. So you look at this, you can look at this as a shadow realm, all right? And what I mean by that is, or as the reflection itself in terms of this analogy, if it's a face staring into a mirror, faceless face, mirror of manifestation, we're in the middle of the projection and the reflection. You know what I'm saying? Coming back. And David Bohm touches on this, a philosopher and quantum physicist, David Bohm, B-O-H-M. Look into him. He's a, he's a really interesting guy. A lot of cool theories. And um, give it a read. It's worth your while. Trust. And he talks about this implicate order and explicate order. So the implicate order is the, the, the realm of yin, pretty much. And it's where all the information is. You know, everything is unified by its information on the metaphysical plane, or this unconscious, ground unconscious, as Jung would put it. All right, and then Bomb talks about the explicate order, which is everything that exists on the physical plane, everything that's visible, observable, everything that we can sense through the five senses, or six sense, which to me is just a combination of all the senses working together to create the sense of what we call intuition. All right. So basically, David Bohm explains with the implicate order of pure potential and information and the explicate order of relative manifestation and form that there is a constant unfolding and enfolding. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the face staring into the mirror and the reflection back and the projection out. You know, God projecting himself through light and then coming back as potential, back as darkness, back as yin. Because that's what yin and yang is. If you look at the two seeds, the seeds are actually flourishing 
the seeds are actually flourishing. You can see the seed there to become pure light, whereas this little seed of darkness ends up flourishing to become pure, pure darkness or pure yin. And so the seeds are constantly growing and it's, it's pretty much, you know, one's always decaying and one side's always flourishing and it's in constant uh, harmony and constant movement. All right, both are always increasing or decreasing. Um, and it's the same thing with this mirror and it's the same thing with David Bohm's unfolding and unfolding. The unfolding is there's the seed of yang which exists in the field of potential unfolding out to become this, to become yang, which is the particular world, the mirror. All right, that's unfolding. So that's pretty much what it means is the information is unfolding and taking form. Just like the wave collapsing into a particle in physics. And then in yin, uh, here you've got the seed of yin, and this is the enfolding. So unfold means to open up, enfold means to take back in. All right? So you've got yin opening up in the, within the field of yang. So you've got the seed of potential opening up over the over reality, the physical plane. So the idea is that when, you know, as soon as something is unfolding and be taking form, at the same time, information and potential is going back to the source, back to yin, the realm of information. And what this basically means is that every single time there is collaboration or synthesis of ideas, or entities or any, any kind of outcome or experience between different people um, even if it's people by themselves and they're just you know synthesizing thought between all the different neurons or in synapses and all that um, basically every new realization every new observation every new combination whatever is gained whatever is learnt from that in knowledge and wisdom principally speaking and folds back to the source and is accessible by anyone else on the physical plane. All right, so this explains the 100th monkey effect, which is this uh, scientific study they did where they, they watched these monkeys, they observed them on this island, a remote island, and all of them used to like, dig up their veggies and they'll be covered in dirt. You've probably heard it, you know, be covered in dirt and they'd, they'd eat the dirt. And then after a while, the baby monkeys started actually cleaning their veggies before they would eat it, right? As soon as 100, 100 monkeys started cleaning their food first before eating it, on a separate remote island without any interaction whatsoever between the two, another pack of monkeys started automatically at the same time, um, after 100 monkeys on that island, they started cleaning their vegetables and eating it. So. You know, people thought, all oh, these scientists thought, well, what is this? What is this connection? It's not physical, it's metaphysical. So this is where the new sphere is a scientific term for the hive mind, the ground unconscious, the noosphere, the newosphere. And that explains what David Bohm was talking about with the implicate order. And when, da when David Bohm talks about the implicate order, there, he also mentions that there is a super implicate order and a super Super implica order ad infinitum. Super, 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 super implica order. It keeps going deeper and deeper through deeper levels of consciousness. David Bohm explains. And everything that we call chaos, all right, everything that seems random to us on this plane really is actually operating on a, on a higher or deeper order of coherency and, and of order, on a deeper level of order. There's no chaos. It's just our inability to recognize the bigger picture or that deeper order because we're on this finite, limited plane. But he reckons there are an infinite amount of orders um, and yeah, it's just down through a chain pretty much leading to this reality. Just like we might have a, a deeper comprehension of higher orders than a snail would, you know, just crawling around in kind of like a two-dimensional world. Or if there was a creature in a two-dimensional world, you know, let's say it's just a flat plane and it's just moving along, or a line, you know, if we put our hand through it, it would see nothing but just a massive wall in front of it. It wouldn't conceive that it was a hand, that there was order to what was happening. It would just think that this is just chaos. So, 
we're basically the, the synthesis of two different elements, yin and yang. All right, we are the reflection, the enfolding, the reflection going back to God and him conceiving of his face or recognizing his image and taking it upon itself. And then there's the unfolding and the projection of the, of the face, the faceless face of potential, of information, of waves. All right? And that's how I view reality. That's how I view the world, that it's neither black or white. You know, we're not, we're not purely here and we're not purely there. You know what I'm saying? Spiritually, we're not here. Physically, we're not there in some place. And I feel that, you know, if you attribute God or the faceless face or yin with free will and consciousness, all right, and choice and all that, and if you attribute yang to determinism, you know, to the physical realm that is made of rules and laws and limitations, then if you combine the two, then you've got... You know, let's say you've got absolute uh, free will and you've got relative determinism. Combine the two and automatically you've got relative free will and absolute determinism, right? Which makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, we do live in an absolutely deterministic plane. People think, oh, I, I chose to do this or I feel this way because it's magic. But somebody could deduce your magical feelings of love for another or your reasons for choosing a certain decision and they could deduce it down to chemical reactions within your body with various triggers and cues performed throughout the day and people do this like mentalists who go out there and deliberately play uh one song over and over in different cafes i'll follow someone around and play all this music same song uh, just to prime the person and insert it into their jingle channel into their mind and then later on they'll be like Okay, I want you to think of a song, and they'll, they'll, they'll guess the song. And then the person's like, how did you guess that? I chose that song myself, and I didn't tell anybody what I chose. But unawares to that person, that they were actually manipulated by forces that they were unaware of. Forces unseen to choose that song. So, so absolute determinism, you know, everything is an equation and everything works within a certain set. You know, when people say it's mind over matter, I actually say, no, that's not true. Mind, it's not mind over matter, like mind has direct control over matter and can change matter just like that. I mean, you know, we can't just, I don't know about telekinesis, but there's no real proof yet. Um, what I prefer to say, it's, it's mind through matter. Mind through matter. There's no way out, there's no way under or over, there's only through. It's the only thing that exists in life. I do not believe in under and over and you know all of this because those terms are relative. But what is absolutely true is through. And what we are is consciousness of yin, of the implicate order, expressing itself through the physical plane of the explicate order and this mirror world, this elemental kingdom of Malkut to reflect the Ketha crown, the tree of life. And we're right there in the middle is Tipperan. Fruit number six, beauty, the image of God, between the face and between the mirror. If you look on the tree of life, we're right in the middle sphere. So we live in a, a place where there are rules, there are limits, and we can only move within these limits. So it's like a game, all right? A game's full of all the different levels, all the possible pathways that one can take, all the different combinations that one can create with different things and resources in this game. But this is a very, very complicated game, very sophisticated and potentially infinite. And how, well, it's not infinite, but there's a lot, you know, but it is finite. What is infinite though is how you can play the game, how many new combinations you can make, all right? How many different outcomes you can create by playing this game. You can just keep playing it. Even though there is a finite amount of space, there is an infinite amount of time. But to me, time is nothing but yin expressing itself through yang. Time is nothing but consciousness moving through space and matter through matter. You know what I'm saying? It's mind through matter. It's time through space. That's how I see it. So we're confined to this 
this, this finite disk with all the possible worlds existing within it, but it's infinite how many worlds we can create each time we play the game. And that's what it's about. You know, it's, it's, it's about playing this game of life and, you know, absorbing more information, absorbing more reflections of the ineffable face so that we can describe the ineffable, so that we can give color and detail to God's face, so that God can ex express itself, explore, understand, just manifest. You know what I'm saying? And in, in the, tr in the, in the um, Kabbalah, they, they talk about how, and this is what the Bible was based on originally, you know, Kabbalah, written, written by Adam, the first man, it explains that God, you know, originally there was nothing, just a in, and then this nothingness, this just pure consciousness created a void within itself. So, yeah, there was pure light originally, okay? Pure light, that's a in, and then it created a void within itself, like a cup, and that's a in soft, and then it, bang, penetrated the cup and, it, and shot down a ray of light, and that manifested as the tree of life, and the ten different sephiroth, or fruit of life, or the ten different vibrational harmonics or sounds, um, of which there are 22 pathways connecting. So there are 22 different melodies that you can create, or harmonics, that, that's the right term. 22 different harmonics between 10 different sounds, and that's where numerology comes from. That's where the 22 major arcana cards of the tarot come from. Uh, there's a lot that you can ascribe to the tree of life, but the basic idea is that God had to create a void a space, a negation of itself, and then lose himself or itself into the space because if, if God was self-aware, then you can't really explore yourself. It's only once you are lost that you are free to do anything and that anything is possible. If you know exactly where you are and exactly where everything is, and if you know exactly how everything is going to turn out, then where's the compulsion? Where's the room for desire? Where's the room for mystery? How can you live? You know, it's like playing a game of chess with yourself and then turning the board around, which is cool, but it's very different if you can create the illusion that there are two separate people playing. And if you can fragment your mind into two players and play that game of chess, it's much more interesting what you can learn and how much deeper you can understand the game from a fresh perspective. So I kind of look at life as being like that with yin and yang, except it's divided into a lot more players and what the Kabbalah explains basically is that we had to forget we had to forget everything we had to cast ourselves down through these 10 different spheres or vibratory levels of existence in order to rediscover ourselves in order to paint God into existence and then potentially return to the source up the tree of life the lightning flash and that's why in the Bible they talk about the, the apple and the tree, and as soon as they were cast down from heaven, Adam and Eve, there was a lightning flash, and then it talks about another tree being just beside that, or near, near there somewhere, apparently. Uh, according to what I've heard, that's actually talking about the tree of life. And that being that when they were cast down from source, they were, they were stuck on this, this physical kingdom, where there was polarities, there was duality, there was yin and yang. All right? So, yeah, that's basically, that's basically what I wanted to touch on. I, I never know what I'm going to talk about when I do these things. I just come up with a topic or an idea and choose my initial direction and then go out with it. Because at the end of the day, I think that's, that's how you get the most fruit out of life. Is realizing that if you try to assume too much yang and you try to control everything, and oh, you need to know the direction, you know, all the time of where you're going, then you're always going to, it's like God, you know, you, you've got to lose yourself in order to find something new. If you're always choosing your direction and controlling everything, there's not going to be room for spontaneity, for outcomes to just occur without you being aware of it. And if they do just occur, you're not going to be open to them because you're too busy forging your own track. You know, so I think it's, it's about balance in this dualistic plane. You've got to take control and have structure in your life, sure, because you don't want your head to be in the clouds. You don't want to just go with the winds of... of of change absolutely especially in the society you won't thrive that way if you want a family and whatnot you need some order in your life you need to build upon a set foundation but 
in order to truly live, in order to truly discover that God, not within yourself, but in order to allow God to flow through you, in order to allow the master puppet to really pull your strings so that you can enjoy this performance and play the role the best you can, then you've got to learn to submit and yield. Not always take control, but you've got to let go of the reins and sometimes go with the winds of change and, and just let things, let things be, as the Beatles used to say. Just let it be. There's a lot of power in that. It's not weak to yield or submit or to not take control, you know, or to give in to the silence. There's actually a lot of power in that place and a lot of benefits that can come from that place. You know, sometimes you find yourself, if you just give yourself to the winds of change, you'll find yourself making decisions, doing things, acquiring things, meeting certain people, and you're not sure why it's important at the time, but you've got some sense that you might need it or you might need that connection or that thing, you know, and and then when time unravels or when consciousness f further moves along the board everything starts coming together and, and it makes it more clear why you made those connections why you felt the need the compulsion the intuition to do those things and that's when you think of intuition i think of the tutor within just like instinct or inspiration all these things are inside but if you're too busy locked in your head looking outwardly at the physical plane and trying to control everything then you're not gonna you're not gonna heed the intuition, you're not gonna follow your instincts as strongly, and you're not gonna be as inspired and moved or impelled. You know what I'm saying? Or inclined. So there's a, definitely a balance, and in a dualistic plane it makes sense that you need to acquire dualistic reins, and you can't whip either rein too heavily, you gotta whip it in unison. Yin yang, yin yang, yin yang, yin yang. You know? So there is an element of being spontaneous. There's an element of taking control, all right, taking action, but realizing when you should be still and realizing that it's not what you don't always need to be productive and you don't always need to be working and doing something as much as with Facebook and the world we live in and status. It's all about people being productive and this, you know, what have you been up to? Anything interesting, anything exciting? Otherwise, people think you're boring if you don't do anything, if you just, you know, but it's good to just be like, sometimes. You know, stillness isn't a bad thing. Sometimes, like I said, once again, I'm gonna drill into you. You need to lose yourself. My dad used to say this to me all the time. You need to lose yourself in order to find yourself and find something new. Like he'd ask me, do you know what you want? Do you know what you wanna do? And I'd say, no, and he goes, perfect. And I go, why? And he goes, because now you don't know what you want. Now you don't know what you wanna do. So you are able or free to do anything. You know what I'm saying? So you need to give in to stillness and not feel like, you know, impatient, try to force yourself to be productive or to make some kind of movement. I think if you embrace those times where there's downtime, it, it, whether it's just a, a few days or weeks or months, you know, I think that maybe there is something that you need to heed inside in order to be inspired, in order to be impelled to do something. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about balance in a world of duality and all these variables coming and, and tipping the scales both ways, you need to move in accordance with it. And to do that, as much as you need to take control up here, you also need to listen in here. And when I talk about the heart, I don't think the heart, you know, it's like, all right, but principally speaking, metaphorically, the heart's associated with your feelings, you know? And I believe there is a link, like when you're heartbroken or when you're happy, you get, you feel like your heart's breaking and your chest gets heavy and it feels like there's cold wind blowing through and it feels like ash for me. It's really heavy and it hurts. And when I'm happy or in love, I feel butterflies. You know what I mean? And you need to give in to that space sometimes and do things sometimes without knowing why. And then in time, you might realize why. Because there is a master puzzler in my belief and there is a master puppeteer and I'm just a puppet like you. I'm just a piece on the board like you. And how we move around, why we click into certain scenes and certain people, we not, might not be aware of at the time because we can't see the bigger picture. You know, we don't have that perspective. To us, it's all chaos, but trust, there's a deeper level of order. You know, I think the more you allow yin to move through you as yang, the more you can appreciate 
the reflection of all this truth and you can enjoy the projection of beauty because in this place there is only relative truth there's no absolute truth God you could say is absolute truth the faceless face the mirror that he looks into that void that he created and then cast himself into to express himself is relative beauty relative beauty because it's all these elements and beauty means art to me it's a physical structure that we endow meaning upon by imbuing it with truth all right so when absolute beauty which is potential and essence and the principles of god infuse with relative truth you've got absolute oh no i'm getting it mixed up yeah absolute beauty and really really oh, i'm getting it mixed up I'm, I'm just getting all tricky in my head the idea is that in this place there exists absolute truth and relative potential whereas god was absolute truth there we are god is absolute truth in in the waves in the potential yang is relative beauty that's it and then when they combine you get the fusion of free will and determinism and you get relative beauty uh truth and absolute beauty so truth is always relative to perspective to you know even though someone might say there's empirical truth empirical truths change with time as well but beauty lasts forever and is potent infinitely potent you can have a painting a thousand people a hundred thousand a million an infinite amount of people can look into this painting and derive a sense of beauty from it and appreciation so potentially the beauty that's within that painting is infinite it's absolute so i think also taking this into account as, as well as being spontaneous and taking control we need to stop needing to know the truth and trying to bottle everything and box and label and pretend to know things and need to know things and just and understand that truth is relative people's beliefs are relative the cultures are relative there is no absolute right or wrong all these ideas are relative because they all stem from the idea of there being a truth it's all relative because it's, it's divided through this realm of duality but what is absolute is beauty and you can find beauty in everything and you can appreciate the beauty in everything and the more you do that the more you'll find you actually get energized you have more power more control more clarity you're more healthy you're happier you know the less you, you need to know the truth out there and the more you can embrace the beauty the better this ride of life is and the more you enjoy the reflection and the projection so project your truth receive the beauty and give to the winds of change and take what you will if you will it to be it will be it's just a matter of time and space that's all I gotta say now uh, it's all about what you take from this with the whole unfolding thing cool cheers for watching guys and yeah fair tidings to you may everything you give come back to you fairly <laughs>